Let's talk destiny, shall we? Hey guys, this is a video I've been wanting to make for a long time now, and the reason for that is simple. I believe in Destiny as a franchise. I think it's a great series with mountains of untapped potential. So let's take a look at how the sequel holds up. At its core, the story of Destiny is all about the loss humanity has faced. In gaining superpowers and immortality, we spurred on the wrath of alien beings who hunted down the great machine which granted us this power. This went horribly. They called it the Collapse, and it really shows that the scope of the destruction was way worse than anything we could imagine. But through sheer will and grit from the survivors, we built up one last city on Earth. We defend it to the bitter end. The story is beautiful, and the gunplay is sublime. Destiny is sort of unique since it's a science fiction first-person looter shooter. It blends RPG elements and first-person shooters in a beautiful world of politics and intrigue. And god slaying. Can't forget slaying gods. The gunplay is also some of the best in the business, and it seems nobody ever really disagrees with that either. However, as with any game, there are some problems here and there, but we'll get back to that later. Now those of you who watched my original episode might ask why I ever ventured back to the Destiny universe when I felt so burned and exploited the first time around. And the answer to that is quite simply that I still believe that Destiny was better than that one incident. I jumped into Destiny 2 because, well, there's really nothing quite like Destiny. The expansive universe is incredibly deep. The lore behind it is like the roots of an old tree with a myriad of different branches and storylines with some of those roots interlocking here and there. If you're familiar with it, I can say it's very much like Dark Souls' lore as most of it happens long before you even set foot in the game. Don't worry, that's the only Dark Souls reference in this video. With the Taken King expansion, Bungie's lore writers even released something of a novella called The Books of Sorrow, and is a collection of lore pertaining to the enemy race known as the Hive, and subsequently the Taken King Oryx himself, whom the third expansion was all about. It's one of the most interesting pieces of lore I've ever had the pleasure to delve into, and it just shows how deep the franchise actually can go. It's a rabbit hole which leads to more and more and more places. Hell, people like My Name is Bife on YouTube do lore videos on Destiny, and him just recounting the basic lore behind what happened before you even step foot into the game itself is over an hour long, and it doesn't even go into specifics either. The lore is vast. And then there's the raids. I think the Vault of Glass from Vanilla Destiny 1 is one of the most amazing experiences I've gone through in gaming. When I finally got enough people to do that raid, and we all went in trying to figure out what the hell it was, oh man, we just lost ourselves. It is, without a doubt, one of the gaming memories that will stick with me for the rest of my life. Crota's End and King's Fall wasn't anything to scoff at either, but man, Destiny 1 really had raids down pat, didn't they? Now, okay, let's be fair and take off our rose-tinted glasses for a bit, because Destiny 1 was not just a walk in the park. It started out being arguably a pretty bad game with an insane amount of hype it didn't live up to. But over time it evolved. Even the lore I mentioned earlier was pretty bad about being in the game. But by the time the third DLC came out, we could see that the lore ties in better and better with the gameplay locales as well. With the help of fan feedback and developer interaction, Destiny got better and better. And then we hit a snag and I fell completely out of it, but I still respected it as a series. And I could see that while I myself wouldn't touch it on principle due to the microtransactions, I could acknowledge that it was a game that grew to become a whole experience by the end. Destiny 2 is out now, and all the reviews were saying early on that it's a leap forward in terms of Destiny 1. Even Jim Sterling said that for all the microtransactions in Destiny 2, it's still a much better game than Destiny 1 ever was. With this information in mind, I cautiously jumped in. I got it on PC, so I had another month to see how the game panned out in regards to reviews, but apart from a little snag here and there, it seemed like Destiny 2 was indeed a substantially better game than the first one a true sequel. 
So I played it and you know what? It was. It's a game which really does incorporate all the best elements from Destiny 1 and brought them further. In Destiny 2, we can now have two primary weapons instead of one. This means that there is no more people running around one-shotting people in PvP with snipers or shotguns like in Destiny 1. It actually means that primary weapons are actually primary. Sniper rifles and shotguns are now relegated to the power weapon slot. Even better yet, the weapons are already fully leveled up when it comes to perks, and the perks are all the same on every variation of that gun. Destiny 1 had random rolls, you see, and it could be frustrating to get killed again and again by the same weapon that you had, but because the other guy was luckier with his weapon rolls, his weapon was objectively better than yours, even though it was the same gun. That doesn't feel good. In Destiny 2, if you get the better devils, you have the better devils. No other roles exist for the gun, at least not until they added the masterwork system, but the differences in stats there are negligible at best. The game even had a story with a cohesive narrative. The stakes felt high, the bad guy was pretty well defined, even if it was a little cliche. It was exactly what vanilla Destiny 1 was lacking, but only vanilla Destiny 1. The Taken King DLC was almost to Destiny 1 what A Realm Reborn was to Final Fantasy XIV, and people loved it! It had everything we could ever wanted, and then some. Sure, it wasn't perfect, but it brought about mostly good. Lots of it were phenomenal additions to the game, though after finishing the main campaign of Destiny 2, I started noticing something. It was a slow change, but I started feeling like the game didn't have all the substance it had at the end of Destiny 1. The weapon system I thought was awesome, now started feeling like it was lacking something. Snipers and shotguns, for instance, received blanket nerfs from Destiny 1 to Destiny 2, but now they also had to compete with rocket launchers and swords, which are both much more useful. There's really no choice to be made there. I started feeling like I wasn't as strong as I was in Destiny 1 either. In Destiny 1, I used to have a primary weapon, a sniper, and a rocket launcher equipped. Now I have two primaries and one rocket launcher. I've effectively been nerfed. Cooldowns on abilities are severely down as well, and all over I'm not even half as amazing as I felt like I was in the end of Destiny 1. I took down gods. In Destiny 2, I'm a shell of my former self. In Destiny 1, grenades, for instance, had a cooldown of a minute, but if I spec the character for grenade cooldown, I could push that down to 25 seconds. In Destiny 2, 1 minute and 25 seconds is the baseline, but if I spec for the shortest cooldown, I can get it down to a minute and 9 seconds. That means that the slowest ability cooldown in Destiny 1 is still faster than the fastest ability cooldown in Destiny 2. It makes you feel a little less like a space magic wielding super zombie, and more like a standard military dude with double jump and a gun that goes pew pew. I also feel like the game has been streamlined to the point where there is almost no player choice anymore. For instance, I can't choose which campaign mission to play, I can't choose which strike to play, I can't choose which PvP mode to play, I can't choose what kind of perks I want on weapons or armor or any of that stuff. There is a modification system, but there is no substance to it as of yet, and I can only choose between build A and build B in my class ability. I'll get back to this later. I also started second guessing the story campaign. It's a good cohesive campaign mode, with writing much better than Destiny 1, since a lot of the lines here aren't just throwaway or instructional lines. But it doesn't actually have anything to do with the overarching plot that was so intricately woven by the Taken King expansion of Destiny 1. Even the raids has this different tone. Destiny 1's raids were high stakes. In the Vault of Glass, you fought for the right to exist within this timeline. In Crota's End, you took down the Hive God who ended the lives of many legendary guardians, like Wei Ning at the Battle of Mare Ibrium. In Destiny 2, you're in like a Japanese game show with Emperor Kallus as your host as you try to run around obstacle courses shooting colorful buttons as you try to impress him. It's not a bad raid by any means, it's actually pretty cool, but I feel the timing of it is a bit unfortunate since it's the only raid available. Luckily, each DLC adds another part of this raid, so it's fun to see it evolve over time, but the obstacle course thing doesn't really make me feel like I'm strong anymore. It feels more like a CrossFit exercise. It is also at around this point where I realized how shallow the experience actually was. There is not much to sink your teeth into when it comes to the story, and nothing in terms of customizing your playstyle. The weapons all feel the same, and there is little of that inventive destiny magic over the weapons. I mentioned the Better Devils earlier as maybe one of the best weapons in the game, and it shares that distinction with the Scout Rifle, the Nameless Midnight. 
This is due to the perk these two weapons share, namely Explosive Payload. As this game has fixed roles, this perk is on all Better Devils and all Nameless Midnights. But the perk variation truthfully isn't that large. Destiny 1 had a myriad of different perks and choices, whereas Destiny 2 has much fewer. Destiny 1 also had Explosive Payload, and as far as I can tell they function identically to Destiny 2's variation of them, but I digress. The point is still that these guns are some of the best in Destiny 2, but put them in Destiny 1 unaltered, they'd be woefully subpar due to the sheer amount of interesting weapon perks Destiny 1 had. It sort of illustrates the lack of power when what would have been a D tier weapon in Destiny 1 turns into an S rank weapon in the sequel. Like I said, the guns don't really feel much different either as this perk variety is gone. Let's have a look at an example. The Jingashi, the Uriel's Gift, the Number, and Positive Outlook. All of these guns look and feel the same. Sure, it's made by the same weapon founder, and sure, some stats are slightly different, but I can tell you that in gameplay, I would play all of these guns almost exactly the same. And the same goes for armor. Destiny 1 had perks which gave you more ammo for your weapons of choice, or longer grenade throws, and you can even spec which ability you want shorter cooldown on, like grenades or your super. Destiny 2 has... Absolutely nothing. None of the weapons in the game have any perks which could change the way you play. Yeah, they've got different stats, sure, but how much does that do? Let's take a look. There are three types of armor stats. Mobility armor, resilience armor, and recovery armor. Each boosting their respective stats. Recovery is simple, it's how fast you recover health after taking damage. Most warlock armor has this innately. Resilience is also pretty simple, as it just ups your defenses, and titans are definitely most in sync with this stat. Finally, you have mobility which ups your movement speed, and hunters are governed by this stat. Now read between the lines here. What this essentially means is that apart from cosmetics, there are only three different armors in the game. The kicker to this, however, is that recovery is by far the most useful, as the difference in healing is so large. Resilience doesn't let you tank much more either. If you have about 4 out of 10 in that stat, you can tank maybe one extra hit from a bunch of guns in PvP. But having it maxed out won't let you tank much more damage. All in all, it's useful, but not as useful as recovery. Mobility though, that one is pretty terrible. It ups your movement speed, but only your walking speed and your first jump height. In a game all about sprinting and double or even triple jumping or using jetpacks, having the mobility stat govern none of these is just beyond me. This means that there's effectively only one armor set to worry about, namely recovery. All those other armors are pretty much useless, and so they go unused. To remedy some of these issues, Bungie introduced Masterworks armor, and now people can reroll their armor stat as they see fit. This is both great and terrible. Yes, now every armor can be used, which means that now I look like a fucking Lannister, which is awesome. But on the other hand, now every single piece of armor is essentially the exact same. No difference between them. I miss that variety, you know? There's been a removal of player agency in general throughout Destiny 2. As I mentioned earlier, the guns and armor feels the same, the perk variety has been reduced, and the guns don't have random rolls anymore. It's not so much the removal of random rolls that bother me, as much as the pure homogenization of it all. The only way to make guns different in any way, shape, or form is via the mod system, which sadly is half-baked at best, and infuriating to deal with at worst. Needless to say, I'm happy when mods 2.0 rolls around, but weapons and armor are sadly not the only places where agency has been removed. There were some really cool campaign missions that I'd love to replay, but I'm unable to choose those missions. I have to go to Ikora Ray, and I have to choose between three random ones per day. I can't even choose which strikes to play either. I have to queue up and hope that I get the one I want to play. I cannot even choose which game mode I want to play in PvP, but I have to queue up in either quick play or competitive. If I want to play a round of control, I'll have to queue up in the quick play list and hope that I get that mode, but I can go several rounds without ever getting to play it. Class builds have also had the player choice removed for the most part. It used to give you the ability to choose freely between a lot of different perks and make up your own perk tree. I could make, for instance, a max invisibility build, but in Destiny 2, all I can choose between is do you want skill tree A or skill tree B? 
All this illustrates is that there's never much of a tangible difference in gameplay with anything you do or any of the weapons you get. It sort of feeds into the idea that nothing in the game matters and that makes the experience feel much shallower than it should. The only place where there are random rolls of any sort anymore are with the microtransactions because of course they are, right? And it is here that I have to ask nicely, what the fuck happened here? These have been under heavy fire ever since the game was released, and it's easy to see why. Every time you level up past 20 or 25 if you have the DLC, you get a loot box. In Season 1, there was a shit ton of stuff behind these loot boxes. Ships, ghost shells, sparrows, ugh, remember that from the previous Destiny episode? Emotes, armor sets, mods, and even fucking shaders, which were previously permanent unlocks, that are now consumables, the coolest of which are only in these loot boxes. People tend to defend loot boxes by saying, it's just cosmetic, as if it doesn't matter. But this stuff actually matters to me. It always has. Looking cool is something I really enjoy in games like these, and in a looter shooter, cosmetic loot definitely matters. Sadly, there's no way to earn ships or sparrows or any of these through activities. They're all based on these fucking loot boxes which aren't exciting in the least. There's no raid ship like before. There's no raid sparrow anymore. They only just recently added a raid ghost six months after launch. Throw in a couple of scandals with experience throttling making you earn loot boxes at a decreased rate and you get at best something that is unexciting and at worst downright malicious. I'd like to point out that the experience throttling is something that most games benefit from, including Destiny 2. But the reason this became a scandal is that the interface would say that you got, let's say, 8,000 experience points for doing an activity, but you could get as little as 400 experience points in actuality. The UI did not reflect the throttling, and when that throttling is tied to something that holds actual monetary value, it becomes much harder to forgive. The reason I said it's unexciting at best is because even if you couldn't buy them, it still messes with the progression of the game. See, you get them as you level up, not for doing specific activities. No more, oh shit, I got a dope ass shit because I beat the secret ending to a story mission on the hardest difficulty. In Destiny 1, their vision was that every piece of loot you got would have a story. For instance, I still remember how happy I was the day I got my Yallerhorn, or how happy I was when I got the Fatebringer finally. I remember how I got the Bane of Dark Gods ship, but how much I coveted the Vienna Singer ship that I never managed to get. That creates a drive to do activities. In Destiny 2, I see an exotic ship, and that just, it means nothing to me anymore. That guy got lucky in a loot box, so what? Getting something like that in a loot box is only exciting for a moment, since there's no story behind them. Me and Tay bought a ship that we had been wanting for a long time, using Bright Dust, this game's freemium currency. And as we got the ship, we were for a moment just like, yes, we got it. But the feeling vanished instantly. Okay, we got it, now what? Too many times have I gotten a loot box from leveling up after doing a completely inconsequential patrol mission, and then I even have to bring the loot box back with me to the tower and open it there. Even if I leveled up by doing an amazing activity, any excitement is sort of dampened by not taking advantage of the triumphant moments. Yes, we beat the last boss of the raid and I leveled up! Oh my gosh, shit, I got the Vault of Glass ship? Awesome! But there's none of that. You have to take the loot box back with you to the tower, and in that time, the whole experience sort of wanes off. There are even times where these loot boxes become downright insulting. Some items, like the Grey Pigeon, are meant for you. It's Saint-14's ship, an absolutely legendary character in the Destiny mythos. The lore tab of the ship tells a tale of how I entrusted the ship to you, the player. Yet, who has it? Fucking Tess Everest or avarice, if I'm being honest. Loot boxes, microtransactions, what were they thinking? All these legendary items, all behind loot boxes. This all culminated in the Christmas event, where they added a bunch of new Christmas-related things. But unlike games like Overwatch, where you get event loot boxes and level ups, you just got the same standard one as usual. Christmas, the spirit of giving. Ugh, more like the spirit of giving Bungie your money. All the while, the only items which actually have random rolls are in these fucking loot boxes. 
Want that super sexy sparrows? Well, good luck getting the perk you want and the speed you want as well. Oh, you want that cool ass ghost? Well, let's hope it has the perks that lets you find resources or chests and also increase experience instead of giving you telemetries which do next to nothing. Oh, you didn't get it? Oh, what a shame. Give me more money. Let's try again. All in all, this just does not paint a good image for Bungie. And I don't really think it's Activision doing this either, as this was on Bungie's own page before it got shared on Reddit, and then they promptly took it down immediately after. Careers, Game Design, Senior Progression Designer, Live, Responsibility, Create Sustainable Player Progression and Chase through Destiny 2's Bright Engram, which are the loot boxes. Manage the creative and craft growth of progression designers on the Eververse team and help establish a strong design culture. Basically make every cool stuff be gated behind Eververse, so people want that. Use data and design sensibilities to define strategies for maintaining ideal engagement patterns and maximizing player satisfaction. Bungie, I'm not satisfied. Design and implement new features and systems with an eye on engagement, retention, and monetization. Mm. Luckily, it seems that all the angry feedback from all of this got to them, because they honestly did change things by the Valentine's event, where you got two loot boxes on level up. One normal and one Valentine's loot box. The kicker is that you couldn't even buy them, you had to earn them through gameplay. That is a huge step forward, and it makes me think that the live team working on Destiny 2 now might have some things figured out. But it didn't really make the loot boxes more interesting, only more ethical, I guess. Which is a start. As it is right now, Destiny 2 is a looter shooter where the loot does not matter, the writing is passable but childish at times, player agency has been completely removed, and loot boxes are being pushed aggressively. This is supposed to be a hybrid of a first-person shooter and an RPG, but the RPG elements are severely lacking, making this more or less just a shooter. The first DLC, The Curse of Osiris, was to many the breaking point due to its poor quality. The game is sadly lacking in many, many aspects. The game is very balanced now, but nobody goes, Oh, dude, you remember the dire promise? That gun was so balanced. No, nobody does that. People go, Dude, you remember the Yalar horn? You remember how we fucking decimated enemies when Solar Burn was on the Nightfall? That was so much fun. People go, Oh, remember the Vex Mythoclast before the nerf? That fucking melted people. In fact, Destiny 2 has a story like that. Do you remember the Prometheus Lens? That turned PvP into laser tag. Heavy ammo only slowed me down. But the issue with that was that the gun was bugged. And that means that the most fun and unique experience that Destiny 2 offered me was by mistake. Oops. And I think that's saying something. Destiny 2 feels like a minimum effort game to push microtransactions. In Destiny 1, we were told that the microtransactions were there to support the game. Here, it feels like the game is there to support the microtransactions. With the first DLC, we were given 18 new exotic items. Some even make a return from Destiny 1. But Eververse got 37 new exotics at the same time. Or, well, let's be fair and say 20 if we don't include weapon or armor ornaments. But do you see what I mean? It really, really feels dirty. But the first DLC wasn't only exotic gear. You also got a campaign which gives you access to something called the Infinite Forest. This place really embodies Destiny 2 as a whole. You get to Mercury, there's a lot of exposition about how endless the Infinite Forest is, how amazing it is, and Bungie themselves have been talking about how its randomly generated nature is also going to provide endless opportunities. You get in there, and man, it looks amazing! In the distance, you can see pillars leading to different timelines, and the world appears before your eyes as you play. This is great! Friends also commented on how this was different from when they played it a moment ago, so it is actually randomly generated as well. How quaint! The downside is that you have to do this every time you do any kind of mission on Mercury, whether it's an adventure, a strike, or a mission but its randomly generated nature would help this issue along nicely, right? However, as you run through it the third or fourth time, you start to realize that none of these enemies pose a threat. Look at this guy, he just fell off. 
You can usually just stand in a single spot and shoot them all down without ever even moving, which doesn't utilize your abilities at all. And after a little more time, you realize that you can seriously just sprint past these enemies and nothing matters. Unlike the encounters in the other parts of the game, this one is randomly generated and it doesn't feel designed. It messes up with the AI and the whole thing just ends up feeling lazy and it cheapens the experience a whole lot. In the end, it makes a whole infinite forest feel incredibly shallow, bordering on nothing more than a glorified loading screen. You know how in Metroid Prime you'd shoot a door but you had to wait for the room to load before the door opened? That's what the infinite forest is, only it takes longer. Imagine that instead of this... You just get this. To me, this showcases a lot of the same symptoms that Destiny 2 itself really suffers from. The first time through, not thinking much about it, it seems really, really cool. The presentation is top notch, but when you start looking a little bit closer, you see more cracks than at a plumber's convention. It's a really shallow experience that is just good enough to mask itself so that most reviewers aren't given enough time to reflect on it, so the scores show a game which is rated much higher than I personally think it deserves myself. So, I hear you scream at the computer, why are you still playing this shit? Why are anyone playing this shit anymore? And yeah, that's actually a good question. So, what's left? I mean, the game is hemorrhaging players. Well, as I said in the beginning, there's nothing quite like Destiny. Warframe I've heard is close, but no cigar. The Division is also close I've heard, but no cigar. And there are bits and pieces here to love. There's a part where you follow a fallen captain and at the end you can choose to either save him or kill him. I decided I'd save him and he left without attacking me, giving up an important resource that he was after. This implies that there's not only hostility with these enemies, there is something deeper. There's a mission where we communicate with the Vex directly in order to find a missing astronaut who died 400 years ago. And it's super goddamn interesting. The art direction and the music is definitely some of the absolute best in the AAA industry. And of course, we cannot forget the biggest fucking babe in gaming. Fucking Lord Shax, who has to yell the strangest shit as a Crucible narrator, but he always manages to hype me the fuck up. Holy shit. I think this might be my favorite line. You two remind me of Lady Ephrodite and myself. She was my partner once. She likes to throw titans. And some titans like to be thrown. In response to the lack of a proper endgame that people have been complaining about, Deej, the community manager of Destiny 2, said that making friends is the real endgame. And a lot of people have been ridiculing him, calling it, Oh, Destiny 2, the friend game. The worst part is, I don't actually disagree. I've made a lifelong friend with Tay in Destiny 1 and now it looks like the same has happened with Keifo in Destiny 2. These things are great, absolutely things I appreciate. But while I made friends in Destiny, we're not continuing to play Destiny since there's so little substance there. Now again, there are things to love here, but it's not at all where we thought it would be. Right now we're going through the same motions as Destiny 1's launch. For comparison, it had a really lackluster vanilla launch. It had a really lackluster first DLC, but slowly over the years it gets better. It's the same as in Destiny 2. With Destiny 1, however, it was easy to forgive the hiccups because this was the first time they tried something like this. In Destiny 2, they're making everything out to be some sort of journey that needs planning and time and effort to figure out when they already figured out these things in Destiny 1 and people loved it. Like take this example, where they say that they need time to figure out a third difficulty for raids so that people who does not have the DLC can still play the hardest mode relative to their access level. Well guess what Bungie, you already figured it out in March of 2017 with the Age of Triumph. Just do that again. It's not even been a year since you did that. How could you forget? 
The worst part about this is that it's so eerily close to Destiny 1's development that I'm wondering how it's going to be in the future. Destiny 2 should have built on where Destiny 1 left off, but it looks like a lot of things have outright disappeared. Now Bungie's spending about a year of development time and support just to crawl back to where Destiny 1 was in terms of quality, and then they can make Destiny 2 the unique and wonderful game that it could be. It's frustrating because I never thought I'd find myself feeling somewhat nostalgic towards Destiny 1, a game I've previously vented my frustrations with. But here we are. I wonder if the same thing will happen with Destiny 3. One day we'll have the perspective to look back at Destiny 2 and think, oh man, I thought it was bad before, but man, it doesn't seem that bad in comparison anymore. Can we just go back to Destiny 2? Okay, I'll end this video with what I started with. I believe in Destiny, it's got issues, absolutely, and while I'm being extremely critical in this video, I still believe in the series. It has so much potential, but it always falls too short. I'm sure this is just a pipe dream, and I've definitely been burned before by this series, but as of right now, I am still here, at least for a little bit longer. I am still hopeful, the potential is there, I am having fun. It just feels like I'm having fun despite Bungie's efforts. I'm also hopeful because Bungie is making steps to make this game better, I just really hope it's not gonna be too little too late. Like I said, it does feel like the devs are actively trying to make things much better over time. You can see that in every This Week at Bungie. Looks like four years of the vicious cycle of, we're listening, no you aren't, finally got through to them. So communication is there in a larger degree than it has been before. It even looks like a lot of the things proposed in the future updates are going to be much better going forward. But their biggest problem is truly the lack of trust in the developer. Right now, Bungie is almost as far down as EA is in terms of customer satisfaction and trust. And that results in good changes being met with so much skepticism. Bungie announced Mods 2.0, but people say that they're so incompetent since Mods 1.0 was something that Bungie was apparently fine with, why should we believe in Bungie now? People post suggestions online, but other people react with, oh, this would be fun, which is why Bungie won't ever add it. And they're looking for any and all catches there could be, as if everything is a contract with fine print. Bungie themselves haven't done themselves any favor in that regards either. As an example, Golden Gun, a super for hunters, was wildly unbalanced. One skill tree gave you six shots, but only six seconds to use those shots. The other gave you three shots, which could do headshot damage and lasted 12 seconds. People were regretting that they unlocked the six shot perk because they couldn't remove it afterwards, effectively making the super worse than not taking it. People begged for it to be 12 seconds like the other one, and Bungie listened. The patch notes say that the two different skill trees now have the same time on both of them. Great! Some people took to Twitter or Reddit saying, <laughs> Knowing Bungie, they nerfed the three shot down to six seconds since they technically take as much time now, but it's the opposite of what people asked for. Turns out that is exactly what they did. Well, instead of one being 6 seconds and the other 12 seconds, they brought both down to 8 seconds, basically giving the 6 shot a little bit of an extra buff, but the 3 shot a massive nerf. It's frustrating and people don't believe in Bungie anymore. That's a trust issue that's going to take years and years of held promises to build up again. And I do think they're trying. I'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt there, but they really shot themselves in the foot, man. Now, I am willing to keep giving the series a chance, but as of right now, there is nothing compelling me to play. As of right now, this has sort of taught me that just cosmetic loot boxes do affect gameplay in other ways than one might think. People say that it's just cosmetic, it doesn't mean anything, and you know what? In Destiny 2, they might be right. Those cosmetics don't actually mean anything, but they sure used to. Thanks for watching everyone. The Go Fast update recently hit Destiny 2, and while it's a lot of good, I don't personally feel like the mobility has changed all that much. To be honest, I think Destiny 2's biggest issue lies with depth. Guns only having one real perk, for instance, but I digress. Next episode is definitely going to be a bit cheerier for sure. I'm done being angry at video games for a while. Now you may wonder why I'm in glorious 8-bit form right now. Well, it turns out that we've gotten a bunch of art from viewers and friends. Red Starfire made these pixel sprites, but he also made all these wonderful sprite works based on Fox Burrito, me, our Super Mystery Dungeon streams, and our Nuzlocke streams. Aren't they great? Ah!
Truthfully, it's humbling to see stuff like this. Thanks so much. Many of these have turned into animated emotes on our Discord server too. His buddy Xerneas did a 3D voxel version of Fox Brito and it looks amazing. Thanks so much, dude. Ah! <laughs> I especially like Red's animation from our Super Mystery Dungeon playthrough. But that's not all. I cannot do this video without a huge shout out to Skywolf for his friggin' amazing 3D art based on our Super Mystery Dungeon streams. Seriously, dude, you have some serious talent. And he's also doing the thumbnail for the YouTube versions of the Mystery Dungeon streams over on Fosy Place. So look out for that. I cannot believe how great this is. Oh my god, it's a Billy! A Billy! And finally, a huge thank you to my patrons. Tay, Robert Quigley, Game Taco, Jared Davis, Elijah Alvarez, Logan C, and Kinwall. I bet you're glad I don't charge monthly now, eh? <laughs> Next video might be a ways off since I'm in the final stages of writing my master's thesis now, but we'll see. Super Mystery Dungeon is next after all. I'll see you all then. Habra!